Yeah. Okay. Thanks so much for Thanks. the little lesson. Uh, this is Professor Maria uh, Williams Hawkins, uh, Professor of Telecommunication, right? And uh, yeah, uh, you did you give to those out? So she will be talking to us a little bit about uh, social, what is it called? Uh, social media, which is going to be a part yes. of our study. Jay said, Jay said uh, that you were using the Mac, and, and I don't know. Yep. I, don't know. Uh, I don't know whether he said that in a positive way or not. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. it means that we have to set up a phone and I don't think you could uh, yeah, for the adapter uh, to go with this. No. Don't worry about it. I think we can just talk. Okay. okay. Oh, okay. Because I'm sure your students are social media users. Yeah, yeah. Internet. What's that? Discuss it. <laughs> <laughs> no. There are times I am. <laughs> so you cannot get that, huh? To online? I mean, well, can... I brought a flash drive. If, there, if somebody else has a PC laptop, that'll work. There's, I didn't uh, bring mine either. That was Jay cool. downstairs. I can watch You really, you know. Could we just talk? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's okay. Have to see it's okay. We don't have to be so high tech. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> we won't we'll be, be high tech right. when we're down when we're down uh, in India. We don't need to be high tech to learn that. Huh. No need. <laughs> well, I don't anyway. Uh, it's five o'clock, so I guess I'm supposed yeah. to start. And I have half an hour. All right, guys. <laughs> I'm Dr. Maria. I'm very pleased to be a part of your class tonight. Uh, I prepared for you two chapters that I had published this year in a book on media and the changes that are taking place. One is uh, mostly historically based, it's how to reach the masses because that's the primary reason in the United States we see a need for media to reach more and more people at a lower and lower price. For us, television is really the cheapest way of communicating uh, because right now it's still effective. But we have, <laughs> you know, I know, man. She doesn't need an uh, adapter. She doesn't need it. No, she, if she, I if I show the PowerPoint, I do. But have she doesn't have the adapter. This is a Mac, and that's maybe. So I just, uh, uh, I hate to be a pain. <laughs> I don't want to trouble anyone. But, but I thought we would talk about social media, and then I am in the process of determining what kinds of things I would do when I go to India using social media and examining how they use social media. So now let me ask you, what do you consider social media technology or technological uses. Are these all urban planning students? No, 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 they are from different, you know, okay. architecture. Oh, like uh, mine, all yeah. right. Okay. I teach a class with uh, Taiwan and I have students from a lot of different places. So, okay. what, what social media do you use? Um, well, Facebook. Okay, you use Facebook. That's uh, number one social media. What else? Twitter. You use Twitter, and we're going to come back and talk about that. Mm. Uh, what else? Um, like um, Flickr. Okay, you use Flickr. I'm back. I think I have a little bit, two sentences about Flickr in those book chapters. How about bloggers? Do I have? Yeah. Any, do you blog at all? Tell me why not, because that's the first one that I put on uh, the PowerPoint, traditional uses of social media. Tell me why blogging is not so popular for you. Um, I think Facebook kind of takes care of all that stuff. Uh, you can post anything you want on there. So we don't, those, let's see, is everybody in some part of architecture? Or are you out people out of architecture altogether? What are you in? 
Indo national studies. Oh, okay. Are you the only person outside of the big building across the street? Only one? All right. Why, why do you not see blogging as offering you an option? Because um, it, bloggers, everyone's, I mean, blogging's like everyone has an opinion. You know, it's just opinion based. There's no fact. I mean, everyone can be a, a self claimed expert on whatever. And since everyone's got opinions, who really cares? <laughs> Oh, hmm. Well, who really cares? Here are the reasons people blog. One is to keep up with what's happening in the field. Those of you who are going to be working in, in specific areas of architecture, urban planning, whatever, may want your voice to be the voice of a new generation. So for us, blogging gets into certain readers' minds a, a philosophy of how to do things. You want to let people know how to live in this tiny space comfortably. Let's hear from Jeff. This is the way you do it. So, blogging gives you a chance to pontificate, um, and it gives you, uh, it gives sponsors. Bloggers have advertisers who support whatever it is that they do. So let's say you design homes. You may have companies that provide building materials, certain quality building materials. Well, he only likes marble in his bathrooms. Her walls have to be covered in silk. So you've got these businesses like, yeah, I like what uh, he says. Yeah, read his column, read his blog. And that creates, it builds up a notoriety for the person who does the blogging. So I don't want you to think that I know your parents didn't send you to the university for you to make money. They just want you to have an education. But in the process of getting your education, if you want to make money, blogging gives you an opportunity to lift your recognition level up. Some people choose to blog by audio. That's a, a popular approach amongst those who do blogging. It's just like running a radio show, but you're doing it from your computer. And people can come to you at any time and listen to your audio report. And we will be doing the same thing for elementary students. They're going to learn to do it themselves. They will be running their own <coughs> talk shows and newscasts as a blog. And they'll be able to send it out so that their parents can watch them on mobile or watch them on the internet through their computers. So blogging is a traditional, a new traditional use of social media. I wouldn't want you to just throw it out quite yet. All right. Now, Twitter, I hear you said you enjoy Twitter as a social media. Yeah. Why? Well, I don't I don't tweet myself, but I receive tweets. Okay. Why? <laughs> Why? Well, because I want I get all my news updates. I get New York Times, I get CNN, I get BBC, I get Deutsche World, I get I can go on. And I just get these updates that they tweet, you know, just on what's going on around the world. Okay. So you're using Twitter as a reminder to check another form of media. And then I get those tweets on my phone. Okay. And what about the rest of you? Nobody else tweets? Tell me, you, you, you just resolutely shook your head. Uh -huh. Why do you not tweet? I mean, I don't use it because, personally, I don't think... I see Twitter as, like, okay for people to follow, like, people, like, celebrities. Like, if you're into celebrities, cool, follow them, see what they're doing. But, like, my personal opinion, I don't really want to listen to myself talk, so why should someone, why should I put my opinions out for someone else to listen to me talk? Okay. A lot of, a lot of Twitter is very self-indulgent. Yeah. <laughs> Seems like a lot of people are kind of, some like, I see like other people that are like, like, oh, I have 30 followers, like, cool, people like to hear me talk. It's like, I don't. I have uh, some students I work with in a student group, and the first one came in. I started my blog today, and you know, you really need to hear what I have to say. I say, you're sitting right there, why don't you just tell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Maria doesn't read blogs. Well, I shouldn't say that. I wrote those two book chapters off of blogs. 
experts who had the research already, and when I could go, go back and check it, they had the latest information because they built up the notoriety where businesses would come to them and say, we're about to do this, and it was great. Uh, <laughs> so um, you don't want, let's see, how many of you text? Well, if you text, who absolutely never texts? This is text messaging. So everybody does. I should raise my hand. I don't. I only text if you put a gun in my mouth. When I get off the computer from doing email, I really don't want to type anybody in. <coughs> if you text, why don't you want to tweet? Oh. I mean, texting is just, it's, it's a personal communication to right. one person. Tweeting is just this, you know, I don't know, universal, everyone can see what you're... Most tweets that I've seen are just stupid. <laughs> so you're telling me, and do you agree with him? You're being very quiet. I know that really... <laughs> yeah. She's a Hindu teacher. <laughs> not, not her. Uh, uh, <laughs> Tell me your name. <laughs> okay. Uh, Twitter is a communication form which allows us to send, what's it, 120 characters in a message. And you can let your friend, if you were a famous star, you could send out a tweet. I'm going to the bathroom. And this, the whole side of the room would be screaming, oh, she's going to the bathroom. Do you know which building she's going to the bathroom in? And it's like, I'm using the ball communication bathroom. <laughs> run, run, she's at the ball communication bathroom. Then somebody with a brain would say, which one? It's like six of them in there. So Twitter permits us to send out very short messages on our computer, on our cell phone, that lets other people know what we're doing. Now, you say you don't want to use Twitter, but I'm also a minister, and I have a youth group. They will sit in the room together and text each other when they could turn around and say whatever they were saying except for it might be something that Reverend Maria should hear. <laughs> so do, are you saying you like one-to-one -one communication better than one-to-many? One-to-one, you text your teacher. Nobody else knows what you sent to him. You can send him a message. What the hell is she talking about? <laughs> And then he can write back and say, damn it, I know. <laughs> okay. But if you tweet, then you send that message out. And we all say, oh, wait, what is this? Who is this girl who asked what? <laughs> so we have one approach, texting, one-to-one, -one, tweeting, one-to-many. There are some good reasons to tweet. Uh, I started out one of the chapters... Twitter was very helpful when um, the hurricane came up in Haiti. It raised a lot of money with short messages. We need money now. Just an address. Send money to this web address. And it raised millions. As I was writing the book chapter when the message came across my computer. It's like, ooh, put this in chapter 11. They're raising millions now, just from tweets. Were you going to say something? I was going to say it was instrumental in the Green Revolution in 09 in Iran. I mean, everything was tweet, it was Twitter. It was like, because everything else was blocked. Yeah. So one of the things that I hope to find out, I know how my students do Twitter in this country, and sometimes it's to raise money. Sometimes it's to raise awareness. Sometimes it's to get a party together. You know? Find a time for catfish and blue meat. Holla back. Uh, so <laughs> it's just 
a way of one person reaching lots of people quickly. You don't have to use a lot of words, a lot of letters, because you don't have the space. All right? Um, in media, which is my area, we like Twitter because it's very successful in promotion. When we want to get a lot of viewers to watch something, if you seen the show Bleeps that my dad started with online, promoted a lot with Twitter, now is a TV show. Something that started out just a show that selected people see now is a nationally broadcast TV show. So from our perspective, Twitter is helpful for promoting things that people might not have paid. Feel free to stop me and ask me if I don't discuss something or you have a question. Now, you started out with Facebook. Is there anybody here who does not have a Facebook account? Tell me why you don't have a Facebook account. Because uh, just it's a lot of it's a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> why do you see it as a lot of work? I, I just can't keep up with it. It stresses me out, so I just don't do it anymore. Yeah, now let me let you in on the secret. You get the account and you never go back to it. But then all those people who kept saying, I wish you'd get a Facebook account. Quit saying that because I have a Facebook account. Mm -hmm. And then I send them an email and say, in two months when the semester ends, I'll be checking all my emails. <laughs> I friended 80 people one day. It's like, okay, they sent their pictures in, they want me to talk to them. Interim. You mentioned the biggest concern for a lot of people who don't use Facebook, the social pressure. How many of you keep Facebook open while you're in class? One honest person. Nobody else has their Facebook account open when you're in class. I'll take my laptop to class. <laughs> oh, okay. One person. Do you keep your Facebook account open while you're in class? No, I don't take my computer. <laughs> Okay, you guys got a, a, a safe <coughs> out here. Facebook is... It's a different building. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you plenty of Facebook accounts open while our students are in class. Facebook is the most popular of our options because you get to do so many things. One, keep up with old friends. I do give Facebook credit for that. Students I taught in 1980 emailed me. I had, they've got gray hair and beards down the year. Here are my two daughters. It's like, wow, this guy's old. How could I have done that? Uh, <laughs> it does help you keep in touch with old friends and get back in touch with people you haven't seen in years. It's really great for the personal. I enjoy Facebook. I just don't check it regularly because I don't like the social pressure of having to stay on it all the time and keep responding to people who don't have as much to do as I do. All right, picture sharing. How many of you share pictures <coughs> regularly? How many pictures, did you send off pictures? My tweeting friend. Oh. When you had less hair, <laughs> than you used to have. Did you send before and after pictures so people would know how you used to look and how you look? Well, I used to look less about two weeks. Like last week was it? Last week I had a beard down to like here. So and I haven't sent off pictures of that. Okay. How many, anybody else decides to show? Uh, that's one of the things my students did. It's like, I know you remember me when I was super skinny, but I'm the mother of three now. Here's how I look now. Here's how it looked when you taught me. Anybody else send before and after pictures? <laughs> Anybody else change? Or you all still look pretty much the same as you did in high school? You look pretty young, mm -hmm. I guess so. All right. Well, Dr. Maria just sent out one picture. Either remember me as I was or get with the new program here. 
All right. Keeping up with the news. How many of you actually read the news on Facebook? Anybody? Our students do read news on Facebook because they need it with their coursework. Are you all checking the latest architectural digest information that might be placed on Facebook? Are you getting any business out of Facebook? <laughs> okay, so tell I me think, what I you think you should include this in your article as well. <laughs> tell me what you're doing with your Facebook accounts. Because the last thing advertising, they determine they can make money on Facebook. So that you're doing something with your accounts because advertisers would not be spending money to be on Facebook if you weren't. So now tell me, what are you using Facebook for? Connect with friends. And okay. I post some videos and stuff and some pictures. Ah, you post videos. Family and friend activities or other stuff? We have a, I, I play in a band, so I post like a lot of band. Okay. So you've got Ooh. music. That's good. Who else? I'm so accustomed to people who share. Using to keep in touch, I guess we have thread messages with our friends. Uh, where, like, I guess because the thread message is one that includes like a bunch of people. Mm -hmm. So, like, if anybody has something going on or they want to just discuss something between a bunch of my friends from different universities, because it's friends from back home. Okay. And we have like a common thread that we just kind of write on every now and then. So, you have a thing that guides the conversation. Mm -hmm. How well do people stick with the topic that's on the table? Um, uh, some people write, like, I mean, some people might say, hey, there's a football game at, like, one of my friends that goes to IU, he's like, there's a football game. He's like, uh, everybody should come to this, or come stay with me, and we'll go to the football game. And so some people will message back, and they're like, sorry, can't, like, I've got this going on this weekend. And then some people are like, yeah, I want to come. And then, like, he'll say, like, send something back that says, like, oh, well, give me a call if you really want to come. And then, so... All right, so you keep topical conversations going. Who else uses Facebook? You do know what Facebook is. All right. I use Facebook. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I rarely get on Facebook. I just check and see, like, I went to Mississippi State, okay. so sometimes my friends uh, email me and just see what I'm doing. And actually, I had two friends that came from Mississippi State, and they emailed me, you from Ball State, because you know, I had the Ball State thing on there. So we met up and you know, talked about good times. So I guess, mm. keep moving with old friends, mm. sharing pictures. Okay. Now, those of you who are not talking, what the heck are you doing with Facebook? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's just, I just text friends. Birthdays. <laughs> birthdays. Yeah, birthdays. Okay. Do you have data, birthday data, celebrations? Yes. Database of birthdays, huh? But I forget my siblings' birthdays. Well. <laughs> Are any of you Skyping? You, you Skype more than Facebook? Yeah, because I connect two people back home. Ah, and see, Skype is the only one I didn't put on there. Mm. <laughs> but... Do, do you use Skype? No Skype? Okay. We need to train you. Exactly. What technology are you? You're, you're looking suspicious. I've got some things on the next page for people. She's a good student. She's, she goes she only to school. She just studies. How many people are Skyping? I have Skyped. Okay. Skyping means what? Skype could also be texting kind of thing or yeah. uh, uh, telephoning. Yeah. yeah, telephoning, video chatting. Yeah, video. And so, do you have a do you set a schedule so that your friends know we're going to talk by Skype? Yeah, that's great. How many of anybody else? We um we did an online class, business class that I was taking, and we Skype uh, just like the international degree. Yeah, my students who take the course with Taiwan do their final project. Oh gosh, I guess about eight years ago, before we could Skype, 
I used to have the library set up special monitors and equipment so my students could come over at midnight and contact their friends in Taiwan and do their homework together. It's like, why do we have to come at midnight? How come they can't come? It's like, their library's not open. So <laughs> we used to do some convoluted activities just to be able to talk. Now they can stay in their beds and they can Skype at home and they can do their projects together with a lot less of a hassle. So that's one of the good things about the technology. I want to get um, just the kind of listing of things that we are concerned about with the use of mobile media because I can't separate my cell phone from anything from my computer. And I don't even have a good cell phone. But I know if I took time to learn everything that it did, I could use a lot more computer applications. I just don't have time. Anyway, but I'm changing phones after the first of the year so that I can just leave my computer at home sometimes and do everything by mobile. Mm -hmm. All right, what do we do with mobile? Old school, all we do is talk to people. How many people only use their cell phones to verbally talk? I don't have texting on my phone. Wow, somebody get her picture. <laughs> <laughs> OK, one person, all right? So everybody else is at least talking and texting, correct? All right, um, how many of you are watching sports or TV shows or any video on demand people in the room? One, no, two, what do you watch? I get like feeds that come through different like college sports feeds and stuff. Okay, so you're watching the sports, you're probably watching everything. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay. What do you watch? I I sometimes follow cricket scores. You know. Oh, okay. When I when I'm when I'm not in not near a computer. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. <laughs> uh -huh. Okay. Oh, oh, that's good. I mean, and we have been slow in the United States with the number of things that we can get mobily, but we're getting better. Uh, one of the conferences I went to in Hong Kong, the man, I can't wish I could think of his name, he developed the best network for programming on mobile. And I was so embarrassed. He said, oh yeah, we're so glad to have our friend from the United States. You'll catch up in three or four years, but just keep working at it. <laughs> oh, okay, all right. I'm away from home. I lose. <laughs> But we could be using our cell phones to raise money. Some people are. We could be mobilizing groups, getting groups together to do things, whether it's for fun or for politics. We could be keeping up with family members. I think you guys are doing that. We could be finding gay bars and other interest groups, because they've got the gay Gaydar app that was introduced last year. We could, and there are other groups that have apps that fit just them, and so you can find out how do we get together. And then we could be doing things that our mom would not want to know about. Your dad. <laughs> <laughs> Your father's of daughters. <laughs> in, in, in some ways, I'm happy I'm the mother of Because <laughs> it would kill my husband. <laughs> so we have specialized apps with our mobile media, and all of those make a difference. One of the things that I hope that I'll get a chance to find out when we go to India is exactly how do other cultures use the technology. And I should have put examine, but I stopped to answer a question, and I wrote exam and kept on going. Uh, now, I, is Every use of mobile media or online computer-based media good? Could there be things that you are using your cell phones for or your computers for that your parents wouldn't be quite so happy about? Huh? 
Why so quiet? You should turn it up. <laughs> Are you writing in the <laughs> Are there? I know you haven't used any of those things, but probably some of your friends or classmates might have used your compu their computers or their cell phones for services that their parents might not want to know about. Can you think of any of those uses? <coughs> Nobody's picked up men or women using their cell phones <laughs> or computers that many, you know. Many of the parents are using those services. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's just too much information. Okay. <laughs> and, and actually, one of the articles that I was reading was talking about 50-year-old women picking up more men online because it's a much easier approach than taking yourself to some bar to look for somebody. So you've got a really clean living class. <laughs> I'm, I'm proud of this. Really, uh -huh. It's amazing. They don't even know people who use technology for inappropriate things. Well, what about um, from a governmental perspective, how could our use of Facebook create a problem? Or our tweeting? Revolution. Okay, you might be saying things against the government. The biggest fight that we had in the Taiwan course um, is the argument over Google and Baidu. What are you going to Google for? That They don't know what they're talking about. Why are you going to Baidu? They have too many rules. Right. And we, we just went back and forth on whose technology is appropriate. So we can create lots and lots of arguments about the different approaches we take. We may find, I hope I find, some ways that the social media that you use just to call and check with mom, I know that's what you're doing. You're checking on your mothers every week. <laughs> of course. Yeah. Is that what you expect your sons to do? <laughs> I used to laugh at those jokes about sons who come home for money, and then I started living it. It wasn't funny anymore. <laughs> now, when he calls, we know he wants something. <laughs> but. I, I want you to start thinking about, would you share your thoughts on ways that we use technology that are different from what the company might have wanted? I jotted down some things that uh, that I learned when I teach overseas, um, and, and I've learned some while working <coughs> with my youth group. I did learn that some guys ask girls out by text rather than in person because they don't want to get their feelings hurt. So if you text a date as opposed to coming up and asking somebody, you might get a no, but you don't get that, uh, you, you don't get those horrible expressions <laughs> that go along with no. Um, I uh, was with my student worker when Starbucks contacted her to remind her that it was her birthday and her free birthday coffee was waiting on her. Stop by in Starbucks to pick it up. Do you guys get those? How does Starbucks know the birthday? Because you sign up. Ah, oh, good. Yeah, no matter where you are, they call you on your birthday to say, don't forget to stop in and get your free, your free coffee. coffee. But oh, my birthday is Christmas, so it doesn't, <laughs> doesn't matter. I blow just about everything, even McDonald's is closed. All right. <laughs> How many of you get messages from Ruby Tuesdays or any of the other restaurants to let you know your coupon is still good for the free dessert? Scotty's. You get Scotty's? Yeah. Exactly what do you guys, the rest of you all get? <laughs> this class is looking more and more suspicious. They're planning to go on catfish. <laughs> <Thank> <laughs> <laughs> what technology would you be packing for the trip class? Would you like to pack technology? <laughs> I didn't mean to download that. Everybody is going to take their cell phone.
called, right? Curling iron, the technology of techno flat iron. I need to work. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how it's gonna work with the plug-ins. We're gonna have to figure something out. Oh, you don't have Can to. you just fry the first time you fry? Oh, oh, you <laughs> bring like seven of these. <laughs> you get an adapter and yeah. you want that for eight dollars, a white, a huge white one. You will need one of those for all the plug-ins there. I use that here because all my plug-ins are from India, so I need to use that adapter. And you can use that adapter anywhere. It has three different so this is step up. Yeah. Step up. Yeah. Because if you bring from India, which requires 220 volts, yeah. here we have 110. No, it works there too. So it's it's from one yeah. to the other. It's a white colored adapter. It's this big. Mm -hmm. I don't have it right now. And you got your spray dollars? Yeah. I've got a couple of different ones. Mine at Walmart in Korea mm -hmm. cost me 16. Uh, no. I, well, the day I came, I was totally Here comes today. Yeah, crying because I did not have my laptop working, my cell phone working, my camera working. So I had to run to Walmart to get that. Yeah. Can I ask a question? To, sure. To, 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 the, uh, on the one hand, you know, like I mean, you you, you were talking about <coughs> social media, you know, like giving more power to the users, right? So, so there are lots of things, including picking up women or whatever, you know, and or or, 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 or fighting fighting against the government, you know, yes. uh, uh, revolution, as he said, or, or, or whatever the other purpose is. Uh, is it also at the same time uh, like maybe if you go back in time, many decades, people were maybe fighting or, or, or struggling outside of the domain of the of the government or the corporations? Is it like while they they fight, are they also being incorporated into the domain through, through this? Yeah, I mean, well, each country is uh, different. While they're fighting, some countries are keeping track of the conversation. Uh, while they're fighting... No, I mean, just the fact that you're using uh, a corporate product. I mean, because like right now, you know, like if Tiger Woods did something wrong, I mean, you can find out. Because, I mean, it's, it's somebody else's uh, thing. It's not like I tell Jeff, you know, like now Jeff says something, I, I deny that. I mean, that thing cannot happen because it's, it's on here. Yeah, that's the deal. That's the, the part that I was hoping we'd get into in our discussion of Facebook. It's so treacherous. You think you're friending one person and you, you're you only sharing with that one. And then that one friends somebody who incorporates their friendship with you into their friendship and now you're talking in two somebody else. There are expansions of our connections with the new technology that keep broadening the boundaries that we think are discrete and making them a lot more open than we realize. Even, even though he said it was a joke, um, Eric Schmidt, the CEO of Google, caused quite a stir when he said that um, people, uh, teenagers today might have to change their names in the future to get away from some of the stuff that they've done in, through social media in the past. Well, we already know in the uh, broadcast area there are companies that have already started hiring people <coughs> to search all of the search engines for your name and for your information or pictures of you. And, and I have to stop my freshman, sophomore students from putting pictures of them kissing people, whoever they may be kissing, on their websites, which are going to be used for job interviews. I love an interesting splash page, but sometimes <laughs> there's too much information on the splash page, and they don't understand. You know, when Wall Street started checking the ears of young men they were considering for jobs to see if they used to wear earrings, and taking their names off the list when they saw openings, so if they're willing to do that, what's going to happen when they see the wrong conversations on your Facebook page, the wrong information on your splash page? So, uh -huh. I mean, that's the problem. It's like forcing people to, you know, we're trying to control what people think and believe, though. Like, no, they're just trying to control who works for them. <laughs> that, that, and, and I understand that, you know, I understand what you're saying from a personal perspective. Yeah. It's my life and what I do after I get off the clock is my business. 
but it's their business whether or not you get a paycheck. Uh, it, I mean, we had a big incident over during the summer with an employee in my previous job, and they put some things on Facebook, and you know, our trust, our the trustees of our board organization were like, we should fire him. And you know, we had someone in the organization say, you can't stop people from thinking what they think. So it saved the person's job, but you know it was a huge hassle. It's a good thing they got a nice person who decided mm -hmm. that they could control whether they got a paycheck from them. Yeah, yeah. When you said that, I was actually thinking more along the lines of not really like people's like companies reading like your Facebook and stuff. I was thinking more along the lines of like the trust issues with interpersonal relationships and stuff. Like you know nowadays we're we're media driven so much like or like like that that when we have like we confide in a friend or something like if you have a problem you know you go to somebody you think is your friend you confide in them through text message or you think that it's safe to send them something important like an important conversation like by sending them a message and you know it's a message on Facebook so they can't you know people can't see it on your wall so they think that it's okay but then in reality you don't know who they show that to, and they've got it in writing, and it comes from you. So they can say, well, this person said this about you when they were confiding in me, and they can show them, like, you can say, look, see, this is where they wrote it, or this is the text I got, and that causes a lot of problems. And that's how we've already had a murder from that happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, suicide. Great, yeah. Thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, thanks so much. Yeah, and Bill, for this help. help. Yeah. And I'll be looking forward to seeing you. Yeah. <laughs> thanks, Maria. So if you want to take a quick break while uh, Jeff uh, sets up uh, his computer and so on. You know, uh, I was going to leave this one. This is after here. Or do you need a different one? I have, I have this. I, that's perfect. You okay, just you can plug in. Oh, cool. So, uh -huh. You can leave that. But uh, yeah, that. it's James anyway. <laughs> are you, are you going to be in here? Yeah. 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 Not the new cast. Not all the time. Yeah. 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 Right, you don't have the prerequisite stuff. Like, no, not Tim. The Guys. It's true, isn't it? Very true. Very, very true. Oh, no. No, no, no. Put his head in. Right, right when he started, I just I saw it coming. Yeah. <laughs> There's a there's an SNL skit that's uh parent, there's a recent SNL skit about about uh parents on Facebook. It's absolutely hilarious. It's only like a minute and a half long. I'll have to look for that. I have um, go on Hulu and look. Parishioners to talk about like they're 30 and they'll be writing information and look on the site. Mom, what are you doing? <laughs> Are you going to be, you'll be in India when, we, when we're there? I'll go with you. So you'll be in Ahmedabad with us? Sure. Great. Great. Look forward to seeing you there. Because when I'm doing research, I'm doing like that. Those are the keys are turned on and put in because I'm like, you know, so it's a real fairy images that I get so stupid, simple things. Uh, 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 uh
is This is that book that I was talking about. Ah, yes. There are copies in the library, I'm sure. There was a, um, I work in the Art Museum of Guard, and there was a tour going through, and they were discussing sort of Indian religious art. Oh, right. Yeah, I think that was uh, about a week or so ago. Yeah, and, and one, of the tour, one of the tour guides said that this is the, the world's oldest religion, you know, and I, I don't know, I just, I kind of laughed, I just, when I was standing what there. What is the oldest religion? Well, what is the oldest religion? Uh, I, I'm a guard in the art museum, and there was a tour going and talking about Indian religious art, and one of the, the, the tour guides said that um, you know Hinduism is the, is the world's oldest religion. Uh, you know. Just uh, very quickly, uh, Jan, do you you have a passport, right? Yes. And you're going to give me the visa application. Yeah, I had everything except for the application. I'll just sitting on my desk. I can print it from. I can get a hold of my email and print it. I can go get it right now. I mean, no, no hurry. I mean, you don't have to do it right now, but but do it soon. Yeah, I have everything. Okay. Just, I left it sitting on my desk. Like, and Chloe, you know, Tad, yeah. you're gonna do it soon as well, huh? The great chair. You already have it. Man, you're so good. I don't have my passport. Sanjeev, you can collect it. Yeah. Tim is, has given. Catherine gave her. How about you? Uh, uh, not you. <laughs> Chloe. I thought it was Chloe. Where's Chloe? I, I just saw, she, I think she was in the bathroom. In the bathroom, yeah. okay. Maya is not here, huh? Okay. Okay, we'll, 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 we'll follow that. Any, any questions that you have? Just, you know, just, just before we start this. Uh, the, the power of attorney forms? Power of attorney form. Power of attorney means that, that you, that you, uh, give power to somebody to sign on behalf of you, you know, like to, you know, he or she can be you, like operate, you know, uh, write something about your bank account or, or uh, you know, uh, sell your land, you know. <laughs> so, so I don't know if you really need that, but I mean, uh, they, they give this form, uh, I don't know why, you know, they may have a very good reason, but I don't necessarily see the international law office, you know, like they, one of the forms they have is this power of attorney that, that, that they give to somebody. I don't know, maybe, maybe they... Yeah, we well, so, <laughs> do we do we turn all those forms in to the the Riker Center or just? No, all the disclaimer forms should be given to us to Sanjeevani, okay? And 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 I'm not supposed to take you without those, but there's no hurry. We are, we are not leaving tomorrow. So, but the first one is kind of like I need to get all these visas kind of like sorted out. Uh, you all have your tickets. Uh, the the uh, the disclaimer forms all have to be signed and given to me before you before you go on your break, okay? Christmas break, Christmas break or Thanksgiving? Christmas break. Christmas break. <laughs> yeah, but I mean try to do it soon, you know, b b before you lose your form and everything, you know. So. <laughs> uh, any any other questions? Do we need that? Um, we had that one form for the international student identification card. Do we need that or? As far as I'm concerned, you don't need a student uh, international student identification card, okay? Because this is not respected in South Asia. It's good if you go to Europe, right? I mean, you can get like cheap tickets, you know, on uh, various things. Uh -huh. But in South Asia, it really doesn't matter. If there's any chance of getting a student, uh, ad you know, admission, uh, I've, I've done this before, you know, like I can just collect you. I mean, bring your student IDs, you know, like uh, Ball State IDs. That'll, that'll work. But usually, the, you know, they don't have these kind of rates, you know, in, in most places. Okay? One of the things I think about the student ID card. About the international student ID card. You get some insurance, so if you lose your baggage, stuff like that, I think it's covered. Mm -hmm. So there's those kind okay. of things. Too. And then there is, there is some news. It's not very good news for you, but, but it's not very bad news either. Uh, the, the university has will be charging a technology fee 
right, for the semester. And they also have insurance. They, it's, it's mandatory now. All of you have to take it, you know. And uh, so these things, they also kind of like have their own ways of accounting. They, separately, they will charge it as a part of the program fee. So program fee will be three thousand plus those. I will send you the, all the information. That's a that's a university fee. You you pay for the program. I haven't changed anything for you, okay? Uh, but but I will send you I will send you that. So that will be probably I'll probably <laughs> add to the last installment. So that's a university fee. Uh, so that means uh, if you have already paid somebody else for your insurance, uh, this is something that you need to discuss, you know, as a as a particular case. But otherwise, everybody who takes a field study abroad. Uh, for, you know, for Ball State, you know, have to take this insurance. Uh, you talking like medical insurance or just like? It's a medical insurance. I think. You know, they have their own concerns. You know, like sometimes as young people, you probably don't have those concerns. You know, like I mean, they probably want to make sure if you die somewhere, your body could be kind of like shipped to shipped to uh, ship back home and stuff like that. So. And uh, and and maybe maybe they have reasons to worry about that. Maybe something one day something has happened uh, at, at that one point. So if we found out that like we're still like my arms. My dad actually talked to our insurance agent, and I can I can use our insurance plan over there. So do we need to contact the school about something or? I think you need to uh, negotiate this with the with the with the Bursa's office or the international office. Okay. Because apparently it's the the international international office has two branches. One branch caters to the students coming from abroad. Right. People like them, visas, you know, whatever, whatever, you know, like I twenties and so on. Another branch is for study abroad. People, the Americans who go go abroad. So that branch of the international office, uh, or Renker Center for International Programs, is called. Uh, that that's the that's the that's the side that that that's imposing all these things. Yeah. Yeah. Does Allstate insurance cover that? Anthem, anthem or? Um... This I'm not sure. I think right. I think you need to you need to you need to talk to them. I mean, I, I don't want you to spend unnecessarily. Like I, I have tried my best to kind of like make it like very cheap for you. I, yeah. I mean, in in some ways. So, so I'm I'm not doing this. I mean, again, you know, like I'm not even promoting this. So, if you if you have a concern, if you want to talk, go and talk. But the thing is, there's, there's very little I can do about some of these things. Yeah. Um, this doesn't apply to everybody, but has anyone heard back on the Ranger scholarships? No. <laughs> I went in and asked them uh, the other day, and they said again that they you'll probably hear this week. So that that could mean in the next three weeks. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> No problem. Don't put that in a text message. No. <laughs> of course not. <laughs> Anything else? Good. So, so you know, if you, if you have any questions, you know where to find me. A B three three one. Uh, 331, is that what it is? Yeah, 331. And, uh, you know, our email addresses, our telephone numbers, and so on. So, like, uh, you know, please contact. Uh, so, we'll uh, uh, get started with session two of Sacred Spirit. Yes, session, session two. <laughs> uh, okay, so last week we started off with that short film about uh, Ganesh and the festival and had some questions and conversation, and then some of you left me questions, and I'm hoping that. Tonight, uh, the presentation I give uh, will address those. Right? Um, a lot of I, I have a lot of sort of text-heavy slides at the beginning, and I realize that that's not the best uh, visual way of learning. But some of the terms are foreign, and it's just easier for you to see that rather than telling you how to spell it, etc. And a lot of these issues clearly are more complex than we have time to cover. I teach two semesters worth just of Hindu traditions, and I still feel like I'm scratching the surface. So uh, you can spend your lifetime doing one small slice. So this is really just a quick overview. And you'll find that everything I said, once you get there, you'll say, huh, I wonder. <laughs> Was that guy nuts or, or what? Uh, but what I learned on my first trip to India was that, that uh, everything you learn in books uh, is great. Preparation, and then you get there, and you're like, "Wow, <laughs> yeah, yeah, what's happening now?" And then, but the good thing is, then you come back and read these same books or different books with new eyes, and uh, it'll be interesting. Yeah. I have a, just a question: when you say you say Garnish. 
I'm sorry, say it again. Garnesh? No, Ganesh. Ganesh. I've also heard Ganesha, like Ganesha. Oh, right. Uh, Ganesha, yeah, Ganesha. In, in, in Sanskrit, often in with an uh, for, usually for male deities. In, in ah uh, for female. I mean, you can get into the grammar, but the point is that usually in vernacular languages, they just drop out. So, oh, okay. uh, so we'll talk about Rama tonight. That's officially his Sanskrit name. But everybody just says Rama. Right, so the, the <coughs> regional languages, like Hindi, for example, they just drop it off. I just said, I was just wondering if there was any difference. Or just oh, no, it's just if you say Ganesh, you sound cool because it sounds like you know something. <laughs> <laughs> if you say Ganesha, and they say, oh, you must be studying Hindi. <laughs> so, so there is a difference in that sense. Yeah, so you. you Old school, pre 28. <laughs> <laughs> no, right. uh, so what I call this is uh, beyond Ramraja, and uh, we have to talk about what that is in the first place, right? So what does that mean? Uh, it can mean a number of things, but I put rule slash reign slash kingdom of, and then I put lord in parentheses, uh, Ram, right? Uh, I did not use the diacritics of those uh, marks of uh, words. I didn't use those throughout, and it's largely because I'm just technologically backwards, and I've got a new computer and haven't loaded on all my fonts that do that. So I said, forget it. Uh, but the A works, so I put that in there. Uh, so the rule of law. Uh, this is something that is critically important today, and is based on a text that we mentioned last time. I said the Ramayana is one of two epics, and this epic alone is about 25,000 verses, so if you look at a Christian Bible, uh, it's roughly two and a half times that in terms of length. And this is a smaller of the two epics. So then the Mahabharata is about 100,000 verses, so four times that. So a huge chunk on the shelves. And these are just two small slices of what one could look into if you are going to read stories about the gods, goddesses, etc. So that's why I said that you can spend a lot of time on this. Uh, beyond Ram Raja, I say beyond that, because Ram Raja has been in the news uh, of late, and especially since 1992. Uh, and let's see if I have slides to talk about this more. Uh, first, let's talk about the plot, right? The, and I should have that in quotes, because there are so many versions of the Ramayana that uh, this is a simplistic overview. Right? So the plot summary, right? So you have Ram, Sita, Lakshman. Uh, Ram is uh, the son of uh, a king. He is said to live in a place. Th these are ideals, right? So an idealized kingdom. It's so fantastic, in fact, that nobody cries, nobody's ever sad, everybody's always happy. right? So you, you realize that we're not talking about real places, but we're setting something up here in the story. Something's going to fall apart, and then everything's going to come back together. So it teaches. <laughs> Uh, about sort of what, what was this idyllic past, and it's going to fall apart. So he lives in Ayodhya, which is the, the name of a real place in northern India today. Okay, so Ram is, uh, he, he's not next in line, but through all these different uh, twists and turns, uh, the evil, or one of the evil wives of his uh, father, uh, does some twists and turns that enables Ram to inherit the throne. Okay, so he is to inherit the throne, but uh, instead of this happening, this evil uh, character uh, says, well, you owe me this boon. Boon is a word that you often you will not mean, but, uh, that is often used when talking about the Indian stories, right? So the king owes this wife but let's just say a favor or a gift. So here's the gift that I'd like to cash in now. I want my son to be uh, placed on the throne rather than uh, Ram. In fact, I want Ram to be exiled to the forest. And this is another common theme, that people spend time in exile, but also that people are to follow what they're told. And this is not a bad thing, that if your elders tell you what to do, you ought to listen. Nihal G, right? And, and he didn't tell you, or no one told you last week, that you were also supposed to touch the ground before his feet and then <laughs> to your chest and wave it over your head. 
So, like I said, you can practice that maybe during. <laughs> Fantastic, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> but, uh, the king had made a promise, and now this wife is saying, you need to cash in on that promise and make good on the promise. So he can't go back on the promise. Uh, so he banishes Ram, who is, uh, eventually well, is now, at this point, married to Sita. Sorry, I, I'm sort of talking in circles. Ram... <laughs> And Sita are banished to the forest. Lakshman is one of his uh, three brothers. He goes with them. Uh, so the three of them go off into the forest. And uh, Sita, to make the long version a little bit shorter, is abducted by the evil Ravan, or Ravana, uh, who is the ten-headed demon king of Lanka. <laughs> and uh, he then, uh, so this is going to lead to war. Uh, so much of the plot involves trying to rescue Sita, and after the rescue of Sita, then to restore dharma. So dharma is the proper place, or, or the way in which society ought to operate. And so this ideal kingdom is run by dharma, according to dharma. And dharma has a lot to say, or the texts about dharma have a lot to say about kingship. So this is sort of, uh, largely written for rulers to understand how to so that's the quick uh, overview of the Ramayana. Okay, now back to Ram Raja. So this uh, rule of Ram, some people have uh, been trying to reinstitute what may or may not ever have existed in the first place. That is this rule of Ram. So if you are to look at a text and say, wow, uh, it, back in Rama's day, everything was wonderful. Why can't we restore that today? Uh, some people then might say, well, let, let, let's see what we can do to restore uh, that type of leadership or that type of rule. Okay, so that, that would be the Ram Raja. So today, we have to jump back to 1992 first. In uh, 1992, there was this uh, mosque, right, uh, Babri Masjid, in Ayodhya, and certain people claimed that this was formerly... Uh, a Hindu temple, and not just any Hindu temple. This is the precise spot where Rama was born. So this is a precise spot where Rama was born. So that makes it uh, a little important. Right? <laughs> so it, it, if this is a precise spot where a deity was born, and then there was a temple constructed, okay, it's already important. Now, what people are saying, or some people were saying, is that... Uh, somebody tore down this temple and built a mosque on top of it, so a double offense. So not only did you destroy sacred space for Hindus, but then you also created uh, a mosque in its place. And without going into all of the history, the best historians that I've read uh, say that there's no evidence for any of this. And it's like trying to apply evidence to texts that really don't stand up to scientific scrutiny. Right. So, for example, there are still people looking for Noah's Ark, and, and that's okay <laughs> if you want to do that. Uh, but there's one being built in the south somewhere, I can't remember exactly where, so you don't have to look anymore, right? So somebody has taken it upon himself to build a huge ark. Uh, uh, you can find it online. Uh, but, but my point is just that if you're reading text that I was calling last week myth, right? If you're looking for scientific texts, then maybe you should be reading science texts. So, but some people will read them differently and suggest that, well, this is uh, what happened. So how, how does one say that a deity uh, was born at all? And then secondly, that this deity was born in this precise spot. And so you can imagine the layers and then centuries and uh, all kinds of things that have happened since then. Well, the reason that I bring this up now is because just a few weeks back, finally, there's been a decision made about this Babur Masjid, because in 1992, some Hindu extremists went and tore it down. I mean, they didn't literally tear it down. I mean, they really just beat it up a lot. And uh, so there's been a lot of Hindu-Muslim tension focused on that particular space. Uh, I should probably say a little more history. But OK, so in 1949, magically, Right, uh, an image of Ram appeared in this sort of side niche of the mosque. Uh, 
I say sort of magically because they're documentaries in which they interview the priests who admit that they actually placed them there. Right. right. In, in the mosque? So in, 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 in sort of a side niche outside. It's connected <coughs> to the mosque, right? So on the sort of on the side. And, and so if one uh, imagines that deities appear on earth, and lots of people do, then it is miraculous and, and extremely important, and therefore sort of buttresses your argument that this was our sacred space, and look, Lord Ram has returned mm -hmm. in this form. Okay, so, but you have people saying that, well, actually, I put it there. So, so it causes a lot of tension, but the, you know, this has drawn out so long that finally there's a decision, and the decision is basically that they're going to split the space and equally use it. And, uh, uh, but I, I bring this up because it shows in one sense that ancient texts are still very much alive. And so people may not read them, but everybody knows the Ram stories, right? So they refer to, rather to Ram Katha, or Ram, Ram stories, and because the Ramayana, or the Ramayana, there really is no the Ramayana, there's various versions. And uh, so, but this comes up a lot uh, to highlight, I think, Hindu-Muslim tension. Uh, but there's a lot of peaceful coexistence, too. Can, can, just to just to uh, highlight the significance of, of this little discussion that Jeff is having right now, uh, Ahmedabad is one of the highly divided cities in in in, in uh, India, and when you know, India has three important things: politics, Bollywood, and cricket, right? Mm -hmm. And of course, Hinduism is there, but I mean nobody talks about that because everybody is Hindu up right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and. And when the Pakistani cricket team comes to play, that's even more important because they are the arch rivals in like, the, more than war, they would like to beat them in cricket. But when the Pakistanis come to India, the place that they don't want to play cricket is Ahmedabad. That's, their, that's the way they show protest. We'll play anywhere but not in Ahmedabad because that's a very bad place. You hurt a lot of uh, Muslims there, that kind of stuff. Right? Just to give you a sense of the connection between Ahmedabad and, and, and what you said. Right, and, and I don't want to scare people, but uh, yeah, some of the worst atrocities, so uh, murders, uh, let's be honest, uh, have occurred right there, right? So in relation to this, so the ongoing sort of unraveling of this, I mean, there were great riots, great riots, that's the wrong word. There were <laughs> terrible riots uh, around <laughs> Mumbai, great riots. Woo! Right? Yeah. And, uh, uh, terrible uh, atrocities and uh, lots of people died. So, uh, it's something that continues every once in a while, people will bring this up, but it has all kinds of religious overtones in the sense that you have politicians who, uh, of particular parties, uh, said they would go on pilgrimage to Ayodhya, so it's called a Ratyatra, so where you get on this uh, chariot, right, so they don't really have chariots anymore, so you get a, a, a truck, um, put, cut out, uh, cardboard wheels on the side, etc. It's kind of fun. It looks like fun. But then you have somebody, a politician, standing up on this truck, pulling symbolically this arrow, not symbolically, but pulling an arrow. You know, this is uh, from ancient warfare. And images of Ram, he always has his bow and arrow because that's his weapon of choice. So you draw on this religious symbolism and then go on this pilgrimage to Ayodhya, swearing that along the way you're raising all this money. And, and people are dying along the way. So, but I don't want to paint uh, the pictures of like the Hindus and Muslims are always fighting. If they were, there would be no India. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and Neil's correct in saying that uh, what's more important is cricket. Right. <laughs> so when I was in Pune, uh, and uh, the cricket, what is the equivalent of the World Cup? I forget the, the, the cricket. Is it just World Cup? Yeah. Okay. So it's exactly equivalent. Uh, so we were watching this and. Uh, India got eliminated. Okay. okay, fine. Pakistan was still in it. Yeah. Pakistan lost. What happened? Fire truckers go up. <laughs> yeah. People flood the streets. Yeah. I, I went down just to look. It was mayhem. People were going crazy. They're lighting off rows of thousands of fire truckers and dancing and screaming in the streets. Yeah. This, what did this have to do with India? Yeah. Nothing. Right? <laughs> so it's correct. The, the, the rivalry is pretty intense. So, yes, sure. This might be, I might just sound really ignorant. Is Juan a Satanist? Mm -hmm. 
Yes. <laughs> I watched Sundown Millionaire. Yeah. You watched what? Sundown Millionaire. Sundown Millionaire. Oh, okay. like my favorite boy, Justin Blue. Five so white papers. Bone yeah. Arrow. Yeah, yeah. that's Bone Arrow. When you said that, I just knew that was it. It's, like, it's yeah. exactly like the Slumdog Millionaire. That's how that's how he remembered history by seeing all these different things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's what I did. Yeah. Um, mother died because they were killed by Why? by Hindu radicals. Why? You know? Extremists. Okay. Yeah, there are actually some good uh, even Bollywood films that uh, have snippets that Bollywood? refer to mm. yeah, Bollywood. Yeah. Yeah. Bollywood. Yeah. There's yeah, Bombay, some, Bombay, Bombay, Hollywood. Yeah. yeah, there are some. Uh, actually, there are some that are decent, um, and some are a little sappy. But uh, the, I mean, the one called Bombay, I think, is worth watching. It's uh, because it was a power, powerful message of unity uh, post riot uh, time in Mumbai to put out a film like that. But uh, uh, okay, sure. Do they have uh, levels of uh, like level of like, hierarchy with the gods? There, there are um, there are texts that say there are 330 million gods, right? So <laughs> how how do you do that? How do you, how do you count them, right? But then there are other texts that say, okay, so how many gods are there really? Okay, 330 million. And then they say, no, how many are there really? Well, 330,000. Oh, how many really? Oh, 33,000. How, how many really? Oh, 33. And then you finally get down to how many are there really? One. Right. So we had part of this discussion last week about is this monotheism? Well, yes. Is it monism? Well, yes. Is it atheistic? Is it polytheistic? I mean, it can be all kinds of things. But I'll talk a little bit more about the hierarchy or these divisions. How, uh, families is what I'm going to call them. Families of uh, deity. Uh, sort of the big three. And then, of course, there are many more uh, beyond that. Uh, so, so what I want to do is talk about uh, some, uh, well, a quick overview of these elements, and uh, talk about, like I said, these are text-heavy slides, and maybe not great, but uh, one good thing about this approach is that by putting out some key terms, like talking a little bit more about karma and karma, that these are used by other religious traditions in India. Maybe not the same way, but they are... Uh, certainly used by others. And even people who would claim the name Hindu are not necessarily going to use these terms the same way. Right? So there's a huge amount of variety. So that, that, that's a good thing. Uh, but the bad thing is that you might then take away from this idea that if we just understand terminology, or if we just study Sanskrit or Sanskrit texts, then we know what is going on in India. And that's what people did earlier, maybe even as late as 19th century. Some people still do it. But suggesting that if we just study enough Sanskrit text, we don't need to go to India. I mean, the texts are there, and that's religion. And fortunately, for at least the last half century, people have realized that if you don't go to India, then you really don't know anything, if you're going to talk about India. So if you're just going to learn it through books, you really don't uh, get very far. But that's what we have to start with. So here are some books. Uh, and I gave them numbers just because the, that looks official, I guess. Uh, they, they're sort of in order of their creation, right? So without going into detail, because again, like I said, you can specialize in these things. There are people who will specialize in a particular text from the corpus known as the Vedas for their entire lives. So that's uh, what you can do. The Vedas are the earliest of the Sanskrit texts, and I could say that uh, lots of Hindus will say they're the most important or foundational, uh, but if you ask what's in them, uh, people don't necessarily know. And that's, that's not necessarily a bad thing, because it's, it's just not uh, that important. What's more important is how one acts, so we have to talk more about that. Uh, but for Vedas, I put uh, Vidya and then hyphen Avidya. Right, so Vidya is knowledge, and uh, the word Veda comes from knowledge, so it's supposed to contain knowledge. And Avidya is ignorance. They put that there because uh, one is to overcome ignorance, right? So not just to gain bookish knowledge, but to gain wisdom, right? So insightful wisdom into how one ought to live. Uh, Shruti versus Smriti. Uh, Shruti is uh, that which is heard, quite literally, but... Uh, it's reserved only for the Vedas, and they are said to be eternal, 
heard, revealed, etc. Right. So the sages who recorded them uh, didn't write them or compose them. These were ideas that uh, were somehow given to them. So if the word revelation helps, then uh, you could, I think, substitute that. Uh, the Upanishads are actually the final layer of the Vedas, and it's what we were talking about last week. We were talking about Atman and Brahman. Uh, Atman, uh, roughly equivalent to soul, but not really. And Vedanta. Right? So this is one form of an understanding of this relationship between Atman and uh, Brahman. And it's one that's uh, popular in the US, particularly, say, people who are not native born Hindus and find certain philosophical ideas uh, appealing, they tend to gravitate toward Vedanta. Not just Vedanta, but it, it just seems that there's a large uh, non-native uh, Hindu followers of Vedantic philosophy. Uh, the epics I mentioned, Ramayana, Mahabharata, uh, Bhagavad Gita, that came up last week. That's critically important. Lots of people have said, isn't that kind of like the New Testament? Mm. The only thing that's similar to that being like the New Testament is that it's small. You can get in a small form and put it in your pocket. Right? So yeah, that's about where the similarities uh, go. Uh, but, there are, but there are other people who are trying to suggest, like, well, that's the one that people really read, right? Uh, well, I don't know. But people know the story. Yeah, and it's not that big of a book. Um, I suggest if you haven't read it, read it. Right? It's kind of interesting. Which one is this? Uh, Bhagavad Gita. Bhagavad Gita. Okay. So this is the one where we learn about Krishna. I said a key teaching. Krishna is Lord of the universe. There are a lot of other things. And someone asked last week about uh, yoga. And there are four different types that are mentioned in this. And uh, so the Gita is critically important for understanding Krishna. We'll have some pictures about Krishna. And for some people, this is... Uh, the most important text. Puranas, there are many. Uh, these are stories where you, like I said, you learn all kinds of stories about gods and goddesses. And that's where if we were to look more closely for stories about the nature, we would find tons of them, not just the one that we went over quickly. Uh, devotional or bhakti, uh, these are poems or songs. This is where you have uh, a so-called democratization, I can never say that word, democratization. Mm -hmm. I don't know why I can't say that. My nieces can say that, right? So uh, <laughs> it's supposed to be this leveling, right, where if it used to be that only people who were well-educated or even, say, from the Brahmin class were able to have access to Sanskrit learning, uh, when you get to the Gita, the idea is that anyone can worship Krishna uh, even with even the lowest of the low or the poorest of the poor, etc. Right. So that's the ideal. And when we get to devotional or bhakti uh, practice, then your writing uh, explodes. Right. So you're no longer having text written just in Sanskrit, but in language where even if you can't read, if somebody tells you the story, it's in your in your, your native tongue, so you can understand this. Right. So that really did change things a lot historically in terms of religious practice. Uh, dharma, Shastras, and many, many more. So uh, I don't want to talk a lot about just uh, the texts. Uh, dharma, this is what the word most often equated with religion. I said last week there is no Indic word that translates directly as religion. But some people will use this one. And I said these are some of the definitions. You can go further with them. Uh, but a lot of people talk about following dharma. Right? Are you following your dharma? Mm -hmm. uh, so then we had that show, What Dharma and Greg. Uh, that, that was a while ago. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have any new <laughs> references. But uh, dharma is something that I think, if it's in the English dictionary, then people know the word. So whether we know it in, in all the nuances is another story. Uh, but these are some of the implications of dharma, and then you can talk about dharma for uh, particular to your family, particular to your traditions, uh, and so on. Okay, so karma literally just action. Uh, we talked about that a little bit last week, and again, all kinds of uh, ideas about 
how one can interpret uh, karma. Uh, it's incorrectly used, I'd say, all the time. When, they, when something bad happens to somebody, they say, oh, it's bad karma. And I just say, well, they, no, it's just something bad happened. But uh, uh, the example I give, though, is because it's really just action. Right? We're trying to figure out what, what is the good life, right? Well, how does one live a life that is worth living? This, I think, is the deeper question. And karma is a word that uh, tries to address this. So, so it's not just a philosophical concept, but it's your actions. What, what do you do that lends uh, a, a life worth living? If that's making sense, right? It's kind of going in circles, but how do you then live so that you are fulfilling dharma? And if you're fulfilling dharma, right, from the, back, the previous slide, right, you're following things like righteousness, uh, your duty, morality, social obligations, etc. So, what is it that you're doing? Uh, and people of various religious stripes have tried to figure out these types of questions. So it's not that uh, it's so ah okay the goal. And I put a question mark because this is just one right moksha. Right? So usually translated as liberation or release. So the idea is that it's not a great thing to keep being born over and over again. So the cyclicality of life is not so great. Um, so it doesn't also mean the, the, the reverse, that life is terrible, right? Life is fine. So, but it's something that is filled with pain and suffering. And everybody uh, experiences this in different ways. So what is the ultimate goal? So if we talk in terms of ideals, the ultimate goal would be moksha or release, and then you would not be born. I keep, I don't want to say born again, because then that brings up other yeah. ideas, right? <laughs> we have to say, you will not uh, transmigrate. Right? So if you ultimately are recycled. Yeah, right. yeah, you won't be recycled. That's an interesting way of putting it. The cycle of uh, like reincarnation. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you said you won't be recycled. Oh, I, thought. <laughs> I thought of these like silly. Uh, I think that means somebody was talking about Facebook, right? So somebody would send me. I'm not on Facebook anymore. I was an addict, so I quit. Right? So mm. I just had to leave it. I had to leave it behind, right? It was hard. I had the shakes, you know. But now it's gone, right? Five years somewhere. Yeah, right. So, but then somebody sent me this funny one. It has this Buddha with a big belly, and it says, you know, Jesus, Jesus saves, Buddha recycles, right? And I was just like, what? Um, but maybe that's why I misheard what you said. <laughs> but again, it's a play on words, and maybe not so funny to people outside of religious studies. But, uh, <laughs> We don't have that many good jokes. <laughs> we have to make up our own, and most of the ones that I think are really funny offend people, so I don't tell them. Uh, so. When you have one, a good example? I, I, I have lots of them, but I won't say them, because some of you might have recording devices. Isn't there somebody on the screen somewhere else watching this? Yeah, so... I can't even see the person, but, yeah. but I see a little yeah. thing up in the corner that looks like there might be someone else. Okay, so... Uh, but there's a tension, right, between dharma, which is fulfilling your social and familial obligations, which means staying at home, etc., right? So family life versus leaving that behind in search of this moksha. So I showed those exoticized images of the sannyasis, those pronouncers, last week to say that, OK, you might have seen images like this, but you'll run across a few in India, but you don't know whether they are there just to get money for photos or whether they're truly renouncers. If they're true renouncers, maybe you shouldn't see them, mm -hmm. technically, but you might. And so. There is that tension that runs through these texts and trying to figure out what do you do. Uh, so there are lots of different uh, means toward that goal. Yoga came up last time. We talked about four, and I said there are many more. And that it's very different as it's practiced in the US. And there are people who focus on this in terms of their study. And I find it fascinating. But there's only so much time in the day and only so many things you can read about. But there are people who have made this their specialization now, focusing on uh, the transnationalization of yoga and tracing it is really, I think, interesting stuff. And it's different, 
but I don't think that that means it's uh, more or less legitimate. And I do the scare quotes because I don't think that there's any version of any particular religion that's pure or untainted, or if that makes any sense. And so the, the, all religions start off with a mix of a lot of different ideas. Otherwise, they wouldn't make sense to the people that they're spreading the teachings to. And that, that when you get into arguments over who's version is more pure or correct, then you have a lot of fights. And uh, those, those are not good. Uh, fighting is bad. Friendship, good. Right? So we can take that away. Uh, okay, so the sex. Right? So this is getting back to your question about how, how what is the hierarchy or how do we talk about the dog? So I would talk about it in terms of uh, families, and then I'll show you some pictures. So the main divisions, one, two, three, right? Vaishnavism, Shaivism, Shaktism. Right, so Vaishnavism, this would also be a, a person would then be Vaishnava or Vaishnavite. Uh, and it comes from the great god. And by great, that's not an evaluative term or qualitative judgment. It's just that some of them are called great gods, meaning that they're uh, more prominent. Right? So for example, so Vishnu is a very prominent deity and is known to take form at various times as an, I said last time, avatar. As an avatar or kind of loosely an incarnation. This occurs when dharma is not being followed. Right? Or, or when things are perceived as crumbling or falling apart. So when the social fabric is falling apart or when people are fighting too much, then it's time for Vishnu in some form to incarnate and then restore dharma. So that's why Dharma runs through many of these discussions. Uh, and then I'll show some pictures of various uh, avatars. Uh, Shaivism, so you would be Shaiva or Shaivite, followers of a form of Shiva. Uh, Shiva is quite different, and I'll show pictures of him as a family man and as a ascetic. He is someone who, in traditional texts, liked to hang out on cremation grounds, and uh, in his office often seen at least symbolically as being on the fringes of society. I mean, who hangs out on the cremation grounds or dances madly? Uh, or it, So we'll show some of these types of images. But most people who become uh, uh, sannyasis or renouncers are followers of Shiva. I say most. You can never say all about any of this stuff. Uh, Shaktism, so this is based on the word Shakti. Shakti means power. And the notion here is actually that uh, no god, right, and I'm talking about male deity, has power without uh, the female shakti, right? So actually it is the woman or the female, right, who gives power to the male deity in the first place. So shakti is power uh, or, or the power in the relationship. And that you can never have the fullness of divinity really expressed without the two together. So, of course, there are exceptions, but we, we can talk about that. So, village goddesses who are not associated with male gods, etc. How how prevalent? Because you know, uh, one, one of my close friends uh, from from northern Sri Lanka, uh, he says you know, like this whole idea of Hinduism is not good, not not correct. Mm. We are Shaivites, basically. Yeah, right. You know, and in, in southern India and, yeah. and, and northern Sri Lanka, so. Uh, so, I mean, is there like a view like Hinduism used to be a whole number of religions, you know, Shaivism and, and Vaishnavism, which is now blended together as Hinduism? I mean, is there something, uh, uh, some thesis like that? Or, 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 yes, or? And yes and no. So, so yes, uh, <laughs> there, there are so many, there are lots of arguments among scholars, that's no surprise, about this old word Hinduism, right? So the people who say the British created it. Yeah, there are people who say, there's no such thing as Hinduism. And there are others who say, wait a minute, wait a minute. There are all kinds of people like Eve, and we certainly can't call it Hinduism. There are others, though, as you say, who actually self-identify according to what tradition they may be affiliated with. So, okay, so we're Shaiva. And then what kind of uh, Shaiva, I mean, is it Shaiva, Siddhanta, or I mean, there are various forms. And so you can get into all kinds of levels. But right, we're Shaivas. And lots of 
Indian Hindus, right? So Hindus in India uh, don't like the term Hinduism. Oh, because it, it's throwing on an ism to something that really very so radically is that I keep saying the word Hindu tradition, and I don't even like the word tradition uh, because that's not good. But there's no good word, really, for this. And because so many people now in India will self-identify as Hindu, that it just seems that, okay, let, we'll go with that one. Uh, but uh, true, lots of people will identify or even um, identify more according to not uh, what is my religious identification, but where, where are you from? Where's your uh, village? What is your uh, class? Or you can say caste, but that's troublesome. But what? Uh, but they want to know where are you from? What do you do? Uh, not not what is your religious persuasion? This is something more recent, and Hindus themselves have taken this up, I think, more and more, and are, and that becomes quite divisive. So I am this, not that. And uh, politicians have made uh, quite a deal out of this. I, think. I just I just shared with them earlier, uh, you know, during my sabbatical when I was living in, in Ahmedabad, when I was looking for an apartment, they, they asked, you know, what is your caste? Do you eat meat? Do you drink uh, alcohol? You know, I mean, uh, yeah. it's quite interesting kind of questions. Yeah, yeah. it yeah. depends. What it, what's the charge if yeah. I drink and eat meat? <laughs> I mean, no, they're making a joke out of something that's very serious. Yeah, they won't. They won't. Uh, they won't rent the yeah, yeah, here. <laughs> yeah, and there are some people who will will only rent to foreigners, and there are some people who will never rent to foreigners. Yes, right. And, and there are some people who will never rent to Indians because they're depending on what part of India you're in, they're afraid you'll become a permanent squatter. That there's no way ever to get you out of there. So. Yeah, absolutely. So did absolutely. it take you a full year to find an apartment? Was it? Did it take all year to find an apartment? Uh, it took some time, but I mean, I was able to find it very fast. I mean, it, it, it took weeks, actually. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's not so easy. I mean, here, you show up, and you look in the classifieds, and there's an apartment, and you go and rent it. Uh, it's a lot more difficult. I, think, I have a question. Sure. About the caste system. Mm -hmm. How yeah. is it stratified? Is it income, or is it, I know it can't be. Is it on top of income, on top of where you live, on top of? Uh, it's there. The problem with it is that it's a system that's not a system. So oh. it's uh, so there are four classes, but then you talk about jatis or, or what is your birth, right? So then you have thousands, right? and that often correlates with your occupation. Mm -hmm. So because of that, though, you have to come up with new ones. So what do you do with now software engineers? Or all of these new jobs that have been created, you have to come up with some new kind of, uh, grouping. Uh, I don't talk a whole lot about the caste system, uh, primarily because uh, it's, it's so difficult to understand. That's part of it. And another thing is that there's a lot more flexibility or movement within it than is suggested by the you mean like moving from different castes? Yeah, there, there is, or that it's not, it's just such a, like, it, it, uh, I don't know how to answer it, really. I mean. Well, I study sociology, so I'm never going to have an actual answer. So good. But so if you're never going to have an answer, then I can give you more. Right? Uh -huh. So they're, they're, okay, so you've got those four classes, but I was having a conversation with someone today, and so what would you do with Bill Gates? Apparently, I think he's still the richest man in the world. So that was somebody passed him. Yes. Okay, let's say that he's still the richest, though, just for illustration. Right. Okay. So okay, last year maybe he was still the richest man, but he was a college dropout, right? So so where does he fit then? He he's not a Brahmin, right? Because they're of the educated class, or they're supposed to be educated, and they're the ones who have been in charge. This is a bunny. Passing on the same thing. This is a bunny. Yeah. He, yeah, he, he, he's just a simple trader. Yeah. I mean, there's nothing special about him, right? So he's lower on this level, but he's got huge amounts of wealth, which complicates it. And that's why it's, it's kind of. And then on top of that, his religion would influence a lot of things, too, right? Right. Yeah, and so what? He's a prominent person. 
Right, and what, uh, so if you're back in India, then what uh, practices do you follow? And the questions he's asking about, do you eat meat? This is important. So some Hindus do eat meat. Uh, you're not going to find a whole lot eating beef, mm -hmm. but uh, lots of more eat chicken than I ever imagined. I mean, it's, it's, so it's quite common. And uh, you'll, you'll have plenty of opportunity to eat. So, yeah, and more than chicken. You can go to, they have McDonald's mm -hmm. now too. Uh, in, in, regard to, in regard to the caste, just, just two quick things. Uh, one is kind of like there's a Sri Lankan student who is studying in, 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 in the university that we are going to. She told me when she went to a rural area, they asked her, what is your caste? They couldn't even believe that, that she came from a different country across the sea. Yes. People come from, from the sea? No. Right? And then they said, uh, which caste? You know, she said, you know, I, we don't have a caste in, in Sri Lanka, right? And then, and then, uh, they, then, then the other people explained, you know, she, she comes from a Buddhist tradition which does not accept, although there's, it, you cannot say there's no caste, but I mean, they don't accept. And then they asked, what are you doing? You know, like, and, and what is your father? And father was kind of like actually a teacher or something like that. And, and what is your grandfather what, uh, doing? Um, they, they couldn't understand because in the caste system you are supposed to be doing the same job, you know. And they were kind of like, no, this is like so confusing. Yeah. And, and then, and then uh, uh, in the market, actually, sometimes the people who sell uh, shoes, they don't let other people from other castes to come and sell shoes. Right. It's their right to, you know, like I mean the caste becomes one, sometimes it, it's an oppressive thing, sometimes it's a right, you know, like this is, this is our job, you know, how, yeah. how, come, how come you do it? Yeah. <laughs> So it becomes, uh, yeah, it becomes very complicated. But your questions are important. Yes. Now, my understanding is the caste system was outlawed with air quotes. It's good that you're putting those up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because in because in legal terms, it's it's outlawed, but in daily life, it's not. Yeah. It, it, uh, the typical answer from me is it depends, right? <laughs> so it depends, right? You can see it in place daily, right, if you know what to look for. And it, it won't take long to pick up on a lot of cues, mm -hmm. right? Isn't it a delete? Is it delete? Is it delete? Yeah. Yeah. Didn't, didn't, didn't delete become no president? Uh, no, but was one of the main framers of the uh, Indian Constitution. Oh. So, and educated in the US as well as uh, UK. So. At Columbia University, so not a bad place, but uh, but it was you know outside of his class, yes. obviously. Yes. It's the lowest caste. Right. So it's not even considered one of the four classes. So you're outside. You're untouchable. Right. So now that's untouchability is outlawed. So now you're a former. We refer to them. You're a former untouchable. <laughs> or yeah, and what are these terms like Dalit? I mean, in can mean ground down. I mean, so that's a, that's like a, that's a pretty oppressive understanding, right? And a lot of this was a self-designation in response to oppression, rather than parijan, which was child of God. I mean, this is something that Mahatma Gandhi uh, came up with, and yes, yeah, sounds great. It was wonderful, and I'm not going to say bad things about Gandhi, even though there's plenty that it could be said now. Uh, I mean, and a lot of people have become more critical of Gandhi, uh, but um, you know, he came up with the term Harijan. So you're children of God. So this is somehow going to make you happy when you're cleaning somebody's toilet. I mean, uh, so you, you're not going to be elevated in terms of the type of work that you have to do. But you know, so it works both ways. So you can take pride, right? So he was trying to say you you can take pride in who you are. In fulfilling your dharma, and it's not the greatest thing. So a lot of people have critiqued him, saying, hey, "Look, you, you uh, wanted equality and all of these great things, but you upheld the caste system. You didn't say anything against it." And that's why Ambedkar, who you're referring to, yeah. Yeah. Uh, came up with a very different interpretation. And they had heated debates. Sure. So, first, <laughs> you know, you know, you I don't know what we call ours. I don't even know if he's 
think, I don't know. I'm just socializing. I'm Republic? modern Marxist right now. So, mm -hmm. um, what kind of just, is it, what kind of structure? What kind of government yeah. does India have? Yeah. Well, uh, people joke, in India, so I'm not making this up, they call it the world's largest hypocrisy. Yeah. Some some people say that. Hypocrisy? Mm -hmm. These are these are people from the inside who uh, make fun of. It, it's the world's largest democracy, uh, but it, it's, uh, yeah, it's it's difficult to navigate. <laughs> it is a democracy. Okay, my second question was. Uh, and it's know. secular. I'm sorry, secular democracy. Yeah. Um. Do they see like the caste system being functional, or do they argue a lot about it, like the inequalities? Do they do they focus a lot on inequalities, or do they see like that's their niche in life with the dharma and the karma and things like that? Do they are they upset with their the ones that are on the lower rank of the caste system? Yeah. Do they? Like fight for more, or do they just say that this is my niche in life? Like what you're talking about the workers. Or, I'm sorry, you're talking about the workers. Right. Do they see? Do they see it's like functional, or do they kind of is it a conflict? Like they want to rise up in society, or are they like accepted? Uh, like a, not like a civil. I don't like a civil war. Would there right. ever be a? Yeah, the <laughs> <All right. laughs> he's laughing because he knows I can't answer. It. <laughs> so, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a question that uh, is important, and I don't know how to answer. Just to just to help him, you know, in in some ways, which is like uh, there are many different definitions, and 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 I would I would consider India to be the largest democracy. Uh, it's also the most diverse place on earth. But also the most discriminatory place at the same time, you know. I mean, so so the, it's a. I mean, Nehru he, he wrote this book, you know, like you need to read a little bit, you know, like uh, of this at least the the idea of India, right? I mean, there are many interesting books written after that. I mean, he in his in, in that one, I mean, I'll I'll bring bring this quote for you. He he describes India as a bundle of contradictions, you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think um, the idea of India. Yeah, but uh, um, I don't want to talk too much about politics, not, <laughs> politics, not because it's not important, mm -hmm. uh, but because <laughs> I don't want to. <laughs> uh, well, I, one other reason, though, is because I think so much of the debates about what is or is not Hindu today are framed through these lenses of Hindu nationalism. And Hindu nationalism is uh, complex in and of itself, but this is sort of uh, often lumped together as a brand or version of Hindu practice that is extremist. Uh, some would say hyper-masculinist, uh, militant, misogynist, uh, sometimes often or just frequently anti-Muslim. I mean, many, many things. Right? But I don't want to characterize uh, all of India that way, or all Hindus that way, or to suggest that that's the only way of looking at mm -hmm. uh, Hinduism. Uh, so that's why I said beyond Ram Raja. So let's. Uh, so I want to move past that. But, uh, okay. So iconographical hermeneutics. So how how do we read beyond reading texts? And that is learning how to see, right? Not just read. So how do you, what do you see, for example? in terms of religion, how do you learn to read the icons or the images? They're called murtis. Uh, murti often, often Indians will call them idols. It's no problem. It's not idolatry. You're supposed to worship this. It's supposed to be uh, the embodiment of the divine. So if you're not worshiping, then there's something wrong. There's something strange. So sometimes they'll just use the term idol. So if you hear people saying idols, uh, it's just natural. But the technical term, murti, or embodiment of the divine, and this notion of darshan, seeing and being seen. So it's not like going, uh, and I know earlier someone asked about the, or made a comment about the art museum. It's not like going to the art museum 
and admiring a piece of art. So that's one thing. You look at it and say, oh, that's beautiful. Or going to a church and saying, wow, look at the magnificent stained glass windows. It's not like that. It's more, it's supposed to be a dynamic exchange, so a ritual exchange. So, uh, like some kind of uh, cosmic electricity going on. And so, uh, an action where uh, you see, sorry. No, no, it's okay. So, so the thing is kind of like, uh, I mean, how common is, you know, I mean, it's, it's fantastic what you're saying. It's just uh, like this, uh, the Ganesh statue is brought in. You know, in some ways, in some ways, the way I saw it on this on this clip that you showed, yeah. uh, it's still a, like a clay thing. In some yeah, ways, right. you know, and then you bring in and you do these rituals, and it yeah. becomes Ganesh, mm -hmm. uh, and then it ends being Ganesh. You know, and then you take it to the. Is that? I mean, yeah. does that make sense? What I'm saying, yeah. you know, in some ways, yeah. Yeah, but <laughs> one, once once you bring to life, so to speak, uh, a ritual object, then it has to be attended to ritually. And that means that daily rituals, and so for most Hindu traditions, there are daily rituals uh, at, at particular moments uh, of the day, depending on what the deity is and what the tradition is. And then days of the week become important, so gods or goddesses are important according to what day of the week. So Hanuman is important usually on Saturday. Uh, and, and Shiva might be important on another day, the goddess is important on another day, right, so you have these individual days, and then months might be important, or you have festivals for a week or two, and then you have the whole festival calendar, so time is very I think, critical to uh, all of this. And yeah, these festivals come and go. <laughs> so it's clay, uh, but it's not. If it's in a temple, then it's permanent, and you've got to have somebody uh, ritually attend to it. Uh, so puja is, again, kind of loosely defined as worship, and it's domestic or public. And we saw from that clip last week that most uh, Hindu devotion takes place within the home. So there was some chanting going on. People, these are just common uh, chants that people have memorized. I mean, they weren't holding a book to recite them. Uh, that. So ritual engages all of one's senses, and it's fundamental to Hindu practice. And darshan can take two seconds, darshan can take two hours, darshan can take two years. It's up to you, right? So in other words, there's the fly-by darshan where you're in a rickshaw or something, and you see an image, and you just kind of put your hands together to fly by. You're not flying in the rickshaw anyway, but as you go by, or walking, and there's a roadside shrine or something like that, or even if you're in a truck or a bus and they're going over the cuts or these mountains, they slow, uh, uh, chug, 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 right, because they've got to do the gears, right, and then the, there's a little goddess shrine or something for, you know, kind of like for good luck, but good travel, but then slow down and throw rupees or throw some coins out, and there's your darshan and go, right, so it's not the same sense of having to go at a particular time, at a particular moment. So you throw out all of these notions of having uh, any unifying sense of uh, a creed, right? So focusing on doctrine, or founders, or particular texts. All of this stuff is thrown out the window and mixed up in different ways. And just about anything you do can be acceptable. Do you do you see this as you know this this uh, Hinduism or religion mm. uh, or however you we call it? Bring some order because you're like I mean in Ahmedabad and so on. I mean when I go in the evening to a temple, I see the poorest guy kind of like comes there and some like you know like uh, pray or worship or whatever yeah. whatever he's doing. You know, like I mean it's it, it's amazing to see like how uh, you know I mean it's somewhat seems like like there's a system that that is maintained through this. You know. Yeah. Um, is your is your question then more about bringing about? Social stability, yeah, right, yeah. family stability, or I mean, they all seem to be kind of like believing in, in, in certain things. Of course, it's not the same thing as, as you're right. doing it, but but there's something similar at least. At least there's a common identity, understanding, and like you and I are the same. Right, you know, I mean, uh, right, and, yeah. right. And then there are so many different temples one can go to. If I go to a temple that's got a form of Vishnu, I can still go to a Shaiva temple. I mean, I can go to all of these places. And, yeah, it's so common that it uh, is, it seems like it's just a part of life. But if people were doing that, then it would seem that something is wrong. And, uh, 
So again, sort of contradictions because you you can call yourself Hindu and never go to a temple, uh, or you can say that I'm going on pilgrimage, but I can't go to Banaras or Varanasi, so I'm going to my local temple, and through these different connections, say this is the same thing actually as going there, and there are all these connections that one makes. So there, there are these threads that sort of run through, let's say, like you're saying, provide some kind of structure or stability or some kind of commonality. Even though we're going to different places, they're still uh, the same. Well, I mean, as Indians say often, unity and diversity. And I say yes and no, right? I mean, it's a lot of people are really strong proponents of that. and. I think it's a good thing, right? Unity and diversity, because if you don't have some sense of unity, we've said it, it'll just fall apart. What, what day is the week begin on? <laughs> yeah, it, it depends. <laughs> there, it depends. We, yeah, it does. It, it, it really does. There are different calendars depending on what part of India you come from. So whether you're, if you generally divide north and south. That helps. Just okay. yeah, just to be just to be brief, you know, uh, there's no one India to begin with. I mean, and and it'll be so funny for you to learn, uh, India, you know, we we identify India with Hinduism, but Nepal's uh, uh, state religion is Hinduism, but not India's. <laughs> so. yeah, it's yeah. So it's good fun. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so I can show at least a few pictures, and yeah. we won't get to the pilgrimage. Uh, so here, if I say a Vaishnava family, right, so left to right, uh, Lakshman, Ram, and Sita. Uh, so these are the three characters that I mentioned from the Ramayana. And so Ram, clearly still very important, right, so very important in terms of if you're going to talk about Ram Raja, or if you're going to talk about politics today. But if you want to talk in terms of temples to Ram, I mean, there aren't that many temples to Ram. And actually, Hanuman is the, the god that's most important. Right? So I, <laughs> why do I say that? Uh, because it's true. Uh, <laughs> it's the only thing that I'll say authoritatively. Yeah. <laughs> why, why am I also saying? Because actually, in practice, Hanuman is everywhere. You'll find him everywhere. And why else do I say that? Because my early research is on Hanuman. <laughs> so clearly, he must be the most important deity. Uh, so I have fun with that. Uh, but you'll see this trend. And it actually, depending on where you travel, if you go through Delhi at all, there's, there's one that's 105 feet. Tall now, they're just growing. Was it? Yeah. So, so they're they're getting bigger and bigger, and oh, that's kind of fun. But you see, like I said, that he's a warrior, so he's got his uh, bow and arrow. Uh, that's a classic picture. Uh, this one, right? So I oh. picked this on purpose, right? Because there's Krishna and that other guy. I would say he looks like. Wow, who's that? Right? So I put that out there purposely because we said loosely avatar and incarnation are kind of the same, and there are certain uh, followers of Krishna who say this is the same, right? This is why it became so appealing to people that we refer to today as the Hare Krishnas. Uh, that they came in, the, they started in the 60s, and yeah, formally, I mean, form, formally known as the International Society of Krishna Consciousness or ISKCON. What we call them Hare Krishnas. And they are devotees of Krishna in a particular way, in a very conservative way. But uh, I, I like the Hare Krishnas. I mean, they've done a lot of great things. They do a lot of great service for people uh, uh, in terms of social service and other things. Uh, Shaiva family, right here, I say family because last week we learned about Ganesh. And there's his mother, Marvati, and there's Shiva. So there's the nice family. Okay, so in this sense, then, they're married. And some of these symbols you'll see either inside or outside or both related to temples on the left. And then on the right, you've got Shiva off meditating. All right, so there's this tension, I said, between dharma, which is uh, family life, right? So maintaining your family values, so to speak. And on the other hand, this tension toward moksha or liberation, so renouncing family life in 
leaving and living a life uh, apart from society. Uh, so here is his classic uh, kind of renunciation uh, pose. Okay, so here, uh, this, now we get into Shakti. So Shakti Sarana. Uh, sarana is another way of saying practice, right? So uh, there are many words for particular practice, but Sarana is uh, the practice that I follow, right? The discipline, I say that. And I just typed in Shakti and came up with this slide, and I liked it. So that's why it's here. Uh, but someone had asked also last week about the third eye. And so the third eye focusing on uh, wisdom. And uh, this is related to goddesses. And the word is shakti, but if you follow it, then you're shakta, right? So it changes. But again, I didn't do mess with the fonts. Uh, so these are two different images of the same goddess. And you can see that they're a little bit different, right? So the earlier poster, these are both sort of posters that you can find on the street. And the one on the left, you've got Kali, uh, quite popular in, yeah, well, yeah, this is, I don't want to talk about that. Okay, so that's the history. Everybody always talks about that. It's a terrible misrepresentation. So Kali, right, the bloodthirsty goddess who's got a skull of heads that she's lopped off. She's holding one. Uh, she's sticking out her tongue. She should have much more blood coming off of her tongue, but she doesn't in this one. Then you look on the right, and you have a much more mellow or uh, transformed Kali, uh, right? So you've got multiple heads, right? But where's the blood? Where It, it seems more tame, uh, less violent. And you can find other images, uh, earlier images than these posters that really show a more violent uh, version of Kali. But, I show these uh, just to juxtapose them with the more wifely uh, or models of what uh, domesticity should be like, right? So the ideal woman, right? And if there is such a thing as an ideal woman, right, well, then you would have to go back to Sita, right? Because she represents a particular ideal for some, very oppressive, for others, uh, empowering, right? So you, you can argue either side. Uh, the one on the left is uh, Saraswati. And she's the goddess of learning, so and music and arts and things like that. You can tell by the imagery. And on the right, uh, Lakshmi, and she's a favorite of business folk because uh, look at all the coins, right? So the words up on the left and right, Shub and La. Uh, uh, I'm forgetting. Uh, one is. Uh, Attaining things and shoot is this purity? I forget. I'm getting shoot. Shoot and love. Okay. Forget it. Who cares, right? I mean, you're, you're not going to learn Sanskrit any next week anyway. Uh, but they, they, <laughs> these are different uh, vi visions, right? So you have the prior picture, right? Dark blue to light blue to very fair skin. And I just wanted to give you sort of some different pictures, some images. We didn't go into detail because I enjoy the questions, but uh, <laughs> if we don't have questions, it's not a conversation. Yeah. And in fact, I, I apologize already. Uh, well, it's almost time to go, right? I apologize because I talk so much. And I, I sometimes uh, get criticized by my students for not talking enough. And then they're <laughs> because I, I want it all to be discussion driven. And I say, so what do you have to say? And they've got nothing to say. So I just say, okay, then we're going to have story time. Uh, because if you didn't do the work, then there's nothing to talk about. Right? So if I do conversation based stuff, but I thought that uh, tonight I should give a little more structure. Uh, I have up there pilgrimage to Thunderport. I think it's fantastic. And we could. Uh, do that next week, or if yeah. Hall has something else in mind. No, no, that's fine. It gives then, it gives sort of, uh, it, it's an illustration of all the stuff we've been talking about. And it's something that I've been on uh, a number of times. Not the actual pilgrimage, but I think to the place. And uh, uh, thank you for listening to me, listening to me around the time. It's fantastic. Any quick questions? <laughs> not, not, not Chloe. <laughs> <laughs> These are good.
questions yeah, that are just yeah. too complicated yeah, yeah. to answer. Sociology is... No, I love sociology. They're right down the, they're right down the hall from us. So you have fantastic people there. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks again.